Hi, I'm James Verdier, and welcome to the American Institute of Biological Sciences Bioscience Talks, which is a forum for integrating the life sciences. For today's episode, we're joined by Paul Humphreys, who's an associate professor in ecology at Charles Sturt University in the School of Agricultural, Environmental, and Veterinary Sciences. He was here to talk about a recently published article in Bioscience entitled Flood Ecology. We had a great discussion about the sometimes uneasy relationship that people have with river floods, as well as some of the ways that we might improve our understanding of them in general, and a whole host of other topics. And one last quick note before we go to the interview, Dr. Humphreys is also very generously offered to share a version of our chat on his excellent podcast, Reophilia. I'll include a link in the show notes. It's mostly great conversations with freshwater ecologists in Australia. I think you'll enjoy it. Uh, go ahead and check it out right after you're finished listening to this one. For now, let's go to the interview. Thank you very much for joining me today. Oh, it's a pleasure, James. Okay, so today we're going to be talking about flooding and river flooding in particular. And one of the things that I found interesting in the article um, was the description of a sort of conflicted relationship that, that humans have with floods. And I was hoping you could just tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, look, it, it, it fascinates me too. It's one of the, the things that has really uh, uh, intrigued me for many, for many years. And in fact, I've considered writing a, a whole book on it at, at times that I may still do. It's it, the realization that most of the sort of cities and towns, and even that some of the mega cities. You think about um, Paris and London, and um, and Los Angeles and San Francisco and and Vienna and you, you, you know you name it around the world. Most of those cities are uh, have been settled along a river system of some description and have probably settled along there because. Um, of the benefits supplied by the river system, um, mostly I would say because of easy access to fresh water, but also because initially because of the the uh, fertility of the soils uh, alongside the rivers. You know, Egypt's a classic example of where there's not much rainfall in in the location of many of the cities, but the Nile provides the water and the flooding which allowed an ancient civilization to rise and exist for such a long period of time so these these cities these you know hamlets then 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 villages then towns then cities then mega cities that grew up uh, alongside their rivers took advantage of the resources they provided there's lots more that i could talk about in terms of those resources but then the conflict becomes oh actually sometimes it starts very early but because of the, the relatively small population sizes, it's not so much a problem that people could move, rebuild um, fairly small um, settlements again once the floods have receded. They could move them when the when the water came in, but then gradually the the the, the infrastructure gets more solid, unmovable, and then it becomes a problem because it starts to get seriously damaged by the floods. So it's this it's really paradoxical to the relationship conflicted relationship with with rivers we love them we want to be near them but they could also cause death and destruction once we start to sort of stay in one place for any length of time yeah and then that's incredibly tricky too because you know the the exact reasons why one would want to inhabit such an area is because you know you've had sediment that's been left there that's enriched the soil it's good for agriculture but at the same time you know it's periodically underwater yeah exactly um and uh, the classic example in Australia of, of this this small town called Gundagai, which is not far from where I live, it's a couple of hours north towards Sydney, and um, the people recognised um, the the Europeans, I should say, who who settled. Um, they settled alongside the the river, the Murrumbidgee River, there um, uh, back in the eighteen hundreds, and it was an important place for Aboriginal peoples, First Nations peoples as well. Uh, what the First Nations people knew is that the river flooded every so often and, and therefore you, you didn't spend your whole time on the floodplain, but Gundagai built this town on the floodplain and they had a huge flood, I think it was 1851, uh, 1841, I can never quite remember, which I think killed uh, a third to a half of the residents um, because they had uh, decided that they they were going to move, and in fact, they were many people were saved by the local Aboriginal peoples, and and it was only subsequent to that mega flood that they actually moved the the town to above the floodplain, overlooking the floodplain, um, 
to to avoid that, such a calamity happening again. But uh, unfortunately, many many of our cities haven't done that. I mean, Rome is an interesting example. If you've ever been to Rome, they've built these incredible. Uh, the Tiber runs through the middle of Rome, and they've incredible walls. They're built to prevent flooding, and but R Rome for for centuries had a uh, major problems with floods. And the thing about floods too is it it causes damage. They they cause damage initially and and kill people initially through drowning but then often more people die through disease and flood you know waterborne diseases afterwards because of the, the sort of stagnant pools that remain and the and the um the flooding of of normally sanitary uh, water resources and things of course the romans made use of water really well but um they they still had major problems with flooding and uh if you go to rome now as i said you've got these huge walls along either side of the river it's very very constrained to, to try to prevent the the tiger from causing the damage that it used to in the past yeah and i have to mention at some point in this conversation that our intro music and outro music is um when the levee breaks from memphis mini and kansas joe and i've been using that for about uh, <laughs> nearly 10 years now um so it's it's particularly apt today but i, I was hoping we could chat a little bit about uh the ways that people traditionally deal with this sort of inherently conflicted relationship, obviously levees, but it's, is it, is it just shoring up, you know, the, the sides of the river and trying to manage the water flows and how does that work typically if we can, if we can paint with broad strokes? Yeah, look, look, pretty much, um, pretty much, I suppose the first, before, before major dams were built, <clears throat> levees were one way of doing that. So you provide a, you know, you increase the, the height of the bank, the river bank essentially to, to attempt to limit the the flooding to so it has the river has to get to a higher level before it floods <laughs> um i'm laughing again you know i'm, I'm not la i'm laughing sort of ironically i'm not laughing right. at, at, at the, the damage and destruction it causes but it's um it's to me it's a little bit like um you know inflating a balloon uh larger than it should be that eventually the, the, the bang that it will cause is is greater than than if you you didn't do that because in most cases levees will overtop and um, you can imagine that if you've got uh, uh people living below on the other side of the levee bank and um you've essentially got waterfalls coming over there and causing more more damage than they would have caused probably in the past so in many cases they 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 prevent flooding for a little while and and, and um at that sort of moderate flows, but when the flows get too high, they cause more problems than they would have in the past. And a lot of places around the world have, have built levees to protect cities um, and also to protect farmland. Uh, ironically, um, in 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 Germany, there was a, a big push um, several hundred years ago to protect land from from flooding. So it was draining swamps and and pr actually getting more more. Uh, more land for farming for more for for ag agriculture but ultimately um i i always um say to my students and they look at me rather strangely now they often look at me rather strangely anyway but um that uh, it, uh there was a lovely i don't know whether you, in the us you get uh doctor who uh um this yes. television show okay and there was a david tennant who was doctor who at one stage um, episode on mars uh, and there was a virus that was transmitted via water that sort of seeped into the, the, the space station on Mars. And they tried to prevent it from happening. But if you got touched by a droplet of the water, you, you went strange. And uh, David Tennant, Doctor Who, at one stage says, um, because the water kept getting in, that water always wins. And um, that's my, my motto, really, is water always wins. You can do what you like. You can you can try to prevent it. You can build dams. You can build levees. You can um, seal things up. But ultimately, water always wins. So fighting against it, um, you know, in the short term, you might win a, a few battles, but you'll eventually lose the war. If you if you look at it as a fight, um, water will always find its way through, and will, um, especially in this sort of era of climate change and um, unpredictable uh, climatic events, that you'll get a bigger flood than you. You can possibly predict and um it'll it'll cause the death and destruction that it caused and that floods have caused in the past but because we could only really use um our past data on on the timing and the recurrence of of, of floods to predict what we're going to get in the future and that's and that's going to be limited if if we're where it's what we can predict is inherently unpredictable right and i, I think i've probably steered us 
a little too far in talking only about the human element. Uh, but I wanted to to chat for a moment about you know the effects of flooding on ecosystems and and th their value in that sense. Yeah, look, um, floods uh, to me uh, and, and the the co-authors of the paper that we wrote, uh, floods are all encompassing in terms of their influence on on um, natural systems, the the animals, the plants, the all the organisms, but also the the actual geomorphology, the the physical structure of a river. I mean, it's floods that really define the nature of a river. Again, if I use the balloon analogy, um, you know, you define a balloon by the amount of air in it. So um, you blow it up to a certain point, and that's that's your balloon. You blow up further, and that's your balloon. You let water uh, air out, and that's your balloon. And that's and that's a river. So a a small river by definition has a, has a relatively small amount of flow going through it a large river has uh, a large amount of water going through it and the the uh the recurrence of all the the return time of floods defines the size of the river and the, and the and the height of the river bank so most rivers will flood um every 2 years natural rivers i mean some will more more frequently some less frequently but that every 2 years the the river flow will reach the top of that bank and then it will go over into the floodplain. So uh, floods are, are the, are the um, events that, that do the shaping of rivers. They do they, they create the, the, meand uh, the meanders, they, um, they cut off parts of the river to create oxbows, um, and so they provide the, the, what we call the habitat template on which all the animal, plants and other organisms live. And then, because of flooding going out onto the floodplain, if there is a floodplain um, or over those banks, they also uh, influence the the edge zone, the riparian zone of, of plants along the rivers in a in a big way. They're probably the most important part of it, uh, influencing and also everything else that happens out in the floodplain. So we we tend to think of river corridors now rather than just rivers because the river corridor in, includes the main channel. And it also includes the riparian zone, the edge zone, and also includes the, the floodplain, the, the broader, much, in many cases, much, much bigger area that water will flow into when it goes over the bank. And every everything that lives, whether it be a, um, a terrestrial animal or an aquatic animal, will be influenced by that flood. So when a flood recedes, that, uh, that floodplain environment that has had water on it for a while um, is typically, like I've talked about for agriculture, very useful, but it's also fantastic for uh, terrestrial organisms because of the, of the, the sediment goes on there, the water that's been on there, the growth that comes from that, the nutrients in that sediment, the enhanced growth, uh, which is taken advantage of by terrestrial animals. So you get lots of animals using that during the dry time um, as well as during the wet time. Okay, and just talking about river corridors, are there any generalities that we can draw about, you know, their broad scope and scale you know are we talking about something that's a hundred kilometers wide or three kilometers wide are there any sort of generalities that we can draw or are they all just incredibly varied no well you can talk about the river channel um fairly confidently that the 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 the, the, the channel size and sort of the relationship between the channel width and and the meander length so the length between between the the turns in the river, they're very much um, sort of physically connected. So um, the it's about I think it's about um, I, I can't remember what the ratio is, but uh, if you take a little trickle of a of water that you run down your window, uh, or that you take the Amazon, essentially the the width of the stream and the, and the meander length are related. But in terms of the floodplain, no, that's much harder, and that's because there's a lot of geology involved. And therefore, um, you know, if you if you've got a river running through a canyon, it can't go anywhere, so it just go, it goes up. But if you're going through uh, a sort of um, a sandy sort of area, it can go much wider. Now in Australia, um, we have um, some arid zone streams. Um, and rivers which are in most of the time are just isolated water holes with with no flow between them at all well at least no surface flow because often there's water flowing underground um, but there's no surface flow but when you get uh, a big rainfall event happening those water holes connect up and they overflow and they go out to the floodplain and in that case the floodplain can be hundreds um, in some cases almost thousands of kilometers wide um, and and 
animals take advantage of that by moving between the water holes and moving between river whole river systems so it really it, it varies enormously so there's no there's no um uh magic number that you can say some some have some rivers have no floodplains at all some have vast vast floodplains um so the river corridor um, can be very very different for, in in different uh, circumstances and different locations around the world Sorry to disappoint no. you. <laughs> <laughs> I, I wasn't expecting generalities, but I was, I was, you know, I appreciate, you know, getting a, a more of a general idea um, of, of at least how it works. Um, I'm curious, uh, you know, the article uh, highlights the, the need for a flood ecology discipline. Um, and in fact, you know, draws its title from that. What would a flood ecology discipline do? What sorts of things would you study? I imagine some of the things we've already been chatting about, but what does that? What difference does it make if it's studied as a discipline rather than perhaps as part of other fields? Yeah, look, um, in, in writing the paper and doing the research for it, I, I did a fair bit of um, soul searching, but also reading about sort of what is a discipline, scientific discipline, and whether flood ecology sort of merits that sort of that um, title that. That conception, um, and a discipline really um, is something where is is a it's a way of hanging your hat on a particular topic to bring together a whole range of of um, often in the past disparate um, subjects into one um, un, un, under one umbrella. So to recognise that these topics are all related, that they interact, and that they um, contribute to each other, and that by looking at them uh, as a whole, that they're more than the sum of their parts. So with with the flood ecology discipline proposal, we're suggesting there's all this research going on there, out there. So that, well, there are two issues, two major issues, I suppose. There's, there's a whole lot of risk research going on, and it has gone on for, for decades. But it's been done in sort of uh, to a degree in silos. So people have been looking at floodplains, but not thinking necessarily about um, the roles of flood in influencing those floodplain environments. Or they've been looking at in-channel uh, work, or they've been looking at the riparian zones, but not looking at it as a whole. So by by having a discipline it and and, and defining what can be included in that discipline, and of course that will evolve over the time. It uh, allows a more concerted, um, cohesive approach to the role of, of rivers broad, more broadly, but also the role of floods in, in shaping and uh, the ecology of, of ecosystems and and the evolution of, of the biota in those ecosystems. But on the other hand, too, is, is this general negative perception that we sort of alluded to at the beginning of the talk about floods and the damage and destruction they can cause and they and they and they and they'd still continue to do that um with climate change and therefore um potentially bigger more frequent floods in some areas and 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 not in other areas because it's quite patchy in what people will predict but uh the problem is that people are actually um because increasing populations are actually um settling on floodplains more and more than, than they used to. And that's, and in fact, where damage uh, occurs uh, more frequently than the past. So deaths are fewer now than they were in the past, but damage is, of infrastructure is greater. And that's because people are actually making use of those floodplains. So the discipline idea is to A, bring together scientists working in different disparate parts of pretty much the same field, the same discipline, um, but also to promote floods uh, more broadly and to try to reframe our, our view of them as being um, destructive events uh, that cause that the, that the the reason why we should care about them is because they cause problems for people to the fact that they are actually a very positive thing for uh, ec ecosystems and if we do change flood regimes we change the nature of when and uh, how often floods occur that we we risk uh, changing um, and and for in many cases for to the detriment of the um, the the biota in those rivers. And you draw in the article a comparison with fire ecology. And I remember growing up as a kid many 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 years ago, um, fires were generally seen as nothing other than a bad problem. And now that's been updated. And you know uh, 
perhaps largely as a result of the field of fire ecology's emergence, you know, we have an understanding that fires are beneficial to ecosystems and that allowing periodic burns is a way to avoid worse burns in the future. Is the idea here to do something similar for flooding? Yes. Yeah. Um, I've got several colleagues who work in fire ecology and um, just really interesting to to talk to them about how fire ecology is framed versus flood ecology. Uh, it's very revealing that that it has moved on uh, over the last uh, 50, 60 years or so. Uh, as you say, um, back in the 60s and, and before that, fires were mostly seen as, as wholly problematic and, and just caused uh, destruction and, and death like, like many cases floods are perceived now. But um, nowadays, fire is seen as a, a, a critical part. Now, not to say that you know um, Native Americans and, and First Nations people in Australia and elsewhere have known about fire, the importance of fire for a very long period of time, and managed and used it um, over thousands of years to to, to shape um, their environment for for their purposes. Um, but it's it's taken uh, longer for um, others uh, more recent arrivals to to recognize that but we we do now and in australia certainly um uh it fires seen as being a very important part of of uh, the ecology of terrestrial ecosystems but also now more much more so the management of them and uh, there's there's still debate about how fire is used and and where it should be used but it's certainly seen as being an important part of it um we we drew that parallel because the the fire ecologists and our 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 feeling is that fire ecologists have have framed this well over the last few decades and have uh, promoted the, their ideas and understanding in in um, a more coherent way uh, and and uh, largely achieve their goals i think i mean it's still a lot to be done but largely achieve their goals whereas flood ecology and the, our analysis of the disturbance ecology literature and looking at the flood ecology versus fire ecology um uh framing shows that flood ecology is a, a pretty poor cousin of, of fire ecology at this stage and what sorts of things would we you know perhaps do either from a management perspective or from a you know, a, a adapting human practices to better accommodate flooding, um, or to, to you know to coexist with it in less of a you know a sort of a, a conflicted sort of way. Are there are there concrete steps we should take? Things we should think about. I'm, I know I realize I'm asking you to get out ahead of um, you know a new, a new discipline and make recommendations, but I'm I'm curious about what sorts of questions we would be asking and thinking about. Yeah. Well, look. Um, I mean, the sorts of questions. I mean, there's some fundamental sort of questions really about the roles of floods. Um, and flooding on ecosystems more generally, which then there are many, many questions that um, we can ask about that. But um, if we're if we're thinking about um, uh, uh, flood flooding and importance of flooding and how to maintain and manage floods better to provide ecosystem sort of services, I suppose if you want to put it that way, there is certainly has been a push over the last couple of decades um, to rather than to fight floods and so there's a, a group groups of people have recognized that that fighting floods ultimately doesn't work and that water always wins and therefore um, nature-based solutions to um, things like floods have become more popular over the years and that that means um, not trying to prevent flooding um, but to essentially to divert that flooding into to ways that it won't cause problems for humans, cause infrastructure damage, to uh, also to make use of that water to to uh, provide uh, an environment for, for um, native species. And then maybe when it dries up to also use that land for agricultural purposes, for grazing and things. So um, the, the utility of trying of not fighting floods but making use of them and 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 diverting their power because floods have an enormous energy associated with them can do enormous damage if they if if they do come in contact with solid structures humans love to build solid st structures and straight lines which is inherently um not an, a, a natural thing that you see in the environment very often <laughs> um 
that if we can divert um, that power you know, for good rather than for bad, um, then then everybody wins. The the, na- uh, the natural systems win, um, humans win, um, and uh, we probably will end up saving a lot of money in the process. So uh, it's it's sort of it it our flood ecology ideas cover a lot of of, of ground. Um, we, there are a huge number of dams in the world, more being built all the time. Some are being taken out. Some of the redundant ones are being taken out. But um, in many cases, those those dams do change the nature of flooding in our river systems. And and um, one of the one of the big questions that that we pose at the end of the paper that we wrote was, you know, how can we um, how can we uh, ameliorate the effects of dams either through sort of managed floods um, like they do managed burns um, or or alternative ways of of of, of having flood like uh, events happen despite the fact that we're we've regulated so many of our large river systems in the world um, there are different ways of, of doing that none of them are particularly uh, they're not perfect because dams are built to retain water at times when there's lots of uh, rain and lots of flow and then release later on often during um, drier times and warmer times when the, the water's needed so there is an inherent conflict there but uh, we do need to think about ways of of um, allowing at least a proportion of that water to move downstream at higher levels than uh, we do currently in many cases fortunately in many, and I'm saying that in inverted commas, fortunately, because of course that can cause major problems. Is that we can usually, uh, with those dams, prevent smaller and and moderate sort of floods, but the big ones ultimately we can't. Again, water always wins because there, there'll be enough rain that the the dams will fill up and and then spill. And uh, even where I live in Albury on the Murray River, uh, we've had a couple of major floods in the last sort of five or six years and we've got two big very big dams uh immediately one immediately upstream from albury only uh sort of half an hour's um water flow um distance away and another one much further up um but even those two uh, filled up and then spilled and uh, there was nothing that could be done essentially except to 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 let it go and uh so you know large proportions of uh, the floodplain including sort of access to um, um, suburbs and things were cut off because of floods because this ultimately you know you can't build a dam big enough to hold all that water which is probably just as well <laughs> that, that sounds terrifying um, I, I guess the last question would be the climate change question which is that uh, you know are we expecting to face more of these um, inescapable flooding type scenarios as our you know weather patterns perhaps are altered by a changing climate Look, the, the the science says um, that in some places there will be more frequent uh, high um, big floods, and in some cases it'll be the opposite. So it depends on which part of the world you're in. Uh, uh, to be honest, I can't remember which parts of the world are one and which part of the world the other. But um, it 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 certainly is not across the board that you'll have will have more. Bigger, more frequent, bigger floods, ev- all, all everywhere. It'll be drier in some places and wetter in other places. Uh, and this, this is, um, I suppose, part of the problem is that we're we're just not sure exactly when and where and how big these floods will be. I'm a, I'm a great fan of um, the idea of anti fragility. Um, this Nicholas Taleb um, uh, um, idea about that you can, um, you know, that rather than fighting something that ultimately you you can't know how big it will be or how destructive it will be is to work uh, on the assumption that something bigger and and lar- larger and more destructive that will happen eventually and you don't know when and where and to therefore to, um, uh, to work with it in such ways. So floating... Um, floating infrastructure or something that doesn't need to have be built on stilts that will ultimately not be tall enough for example I, I don't have I'm not an engineer I don't have solutions but I do know that um, that, that we're entering uncharted territory and therefore um, perhaps our 
our ability to predict and our ability to to construct infrastructure that will withstand these types of events um, are, are limited. And so probably other ways of thinking about it uh, are necessary, or not uh, probably, almost certainly other ways of thinking about it are necessary. And it sounds certainly like, um, you know, having a discipline, having a, a thoughtful way of approaching these questions will be invaluable. Um, thank you very much for joining me today. I've learned quite a lot. I appreciate it. Pleasure, James. And that concludes this episode of Bioscience Talks. Just a reminder, the journal Bioscience is published by Oxford University Press on behalf of the American Institute of Biological Sciences and is made possible by the support of our members and donors. Thank you and talk to you next time.